a reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When Paul came to Antioch in Pisidia, he said in the synagogue, My brothers, children of the family of Abraham, and those others among you who are God-fearing, to us this word of salvation has been sent. The inhabitants of Jerusalem and their leaders failed to recognize him, and by condemning him, they fulfilled the oracles of the prophets that are read Sabbath after Sabbath. For even though they found no grounds for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him put to death. And when they had accomplished all that was written about him, they took him down from the tree and placed him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. These are now his witnesses before the people. We ourselves are proclaiming this good news to you, that what God promised our fathers, he has brought to fulfillment for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son, this day I have begotten you. Verbum Domini. You are my son, this day I have begotten you. You are my son, this day I have begotten you. I myself have set up my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. The Lord said to me, You are my son, this day I have begotten you. You are my son, this day I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for an inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall rule them with an iron rod. You shall shatter them like an earthen dish. You are my son, this day I have begotten you. And now, O kings, give heed. Take warning, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice before him. With trembling, rejoice. You are my son, this day I have begotten you. Sancti Evangelii Secundum Johannem. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You have faith in God, have faith also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If there were not, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you also may be. Where I am going, you know the way. Thomas said to him, Master, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Verbum do homini.
Jesus gives us the most consoling teachings today that we are not to let our hearts be troubled, to have faith in God, have faith in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. That he's prepared a place for us for all eternity, a place of communion, relationship with him for all eternity. And he says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way. He's not a philosopher or a prophet who's just giving a teaching or just showing us the way or just pointing out the way, the way to this place of this house prepared for us, this dwelling place, this place of communion. Not just saying, okay, do this and go this way. He's saying, I am the way. Communion with me is the way to this heavenly life, to this eternal life. And we can look at salvation as a mystery of communion with him. That as he uh, suffered, died, rose again, ascended into heaven, through our communion to our being members of his mystical body, we are brought up to heaven. It all depends completely and totally on our communion with Christ, that we participate in the mystery of Christ and his work of salvation, his work of redemption for us. And the way that that <clears throat> communion is affected, takes place, we have access to it today. He came over 2,000 years ago. But today, that is affected in our lives through the liturgy especially through the Eucharist and through all the sacraments that we receive. He is doing the work of this communion with him. He's drawing us into himself, into his life. He's incorporating us into his mystical body. And I think some, oftentimes it's sacramental life of Catholics is misunderstood that we are somehow doing these works. We're participating in the work of Christ's redemptive actions for us. That it's, the Vatican II said, in the liturgy, the work of our redemption is accomplished. It's accomplished in our life, the work that he did. It's poured upon us. It communicates his work of salvation, the fruits of the Paschal mystery. In short, it gives us grace. This share in the divine nature is poured upon us in the sacraments, you know, in baptism, confirmation, and then this summit, this, you know, this fullness of communion with him that we celebrate in the Eucharist, and that's affected in the, in the Eucharist. So in the liturgy, the faithful are enabled to express in their lives and manifest to others the mystery of Christ. We live it, manifest it, it happens in our lives. You know, sacraments are signs and instruments of this communion with Christ. It's an outward sign, a visible manifestation of this, this communion, but it's also an instrument giving us grace to affect this communion. So the liturgy makes the church present, the church being this communion with Christ, and manifest her as the visible sign of the communion in Christ between God and man. And today, these readings here are part of the high priestly prayer of Jesus in John's gospel. And in the liturgy, especially the Eucharist, we are participating in Christ's prayer to his Father. He tells us, no one comes to the Father except through me. And that we are entering into his prayer, his relationship of love, that as he has this unique relationship as the Son of God, we are sharing in that, in his prayer, that witnesses to this and manifests it and affects it in our life. So he is present, praying, we could say, in all liturgical celebrations. The Mass is primarily a prayer and offering of Jesus to his Father and we are entering into that relationship when we come to Mass. The Catechism says in every liturgical action, the Holy Spirit is sent in order to bring us into communion with Christ and so to form his body. The Holy Spirit, 
you know, we, we're about to, the next few verses, eventually we're going to get to when he speaks of the vine and the branches, that he is the vine, we are the branches, grafted onto him, joined to him. And we can look at that sap as being the Holy Spirit, the sap and the vine. So that Holy Spirit draws us into that communion. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, poured upon us in all the sacraments. And today, we celebrate a saint, uh, St. Leopold Mandich, who's one of the patron saints of confessors. During the Jubilee of Mercy, they brought his body to Rome and was a witness to God's mercy, forgiveness, his reconciliation. So we have today the sacrament of reconciliation. We call it oftentimes confession. But we are, if we've fallen, it's necessary if we've fallen into grave sin, mortal sin, to confess our sins at least once a year, or serious sins for certain, but uh, recommended to get to confession as soon as you can if you fall into serious sin. But if we've torn ourselves off the branch, if we've dissociated ourselves from the way, which is Jesus Christ, through confession we are brought back. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful sacrament. And Leopold is a witness to all priests in his ministry in the confessional. He was born in 1866. He was Croatian. Today it's modern day Montenegro. He died in 1942. He was a Capuchin Franciscan, but he served most of his life in Padua, Italy. That he served there um, many years. He was four foot, five inches tall. He suffered from birth deformities. He stammered in his speech. He had chronic arthritis, <clears throat> and he wanted to be a missionary in Eastern Europe. He wanted to serve and the reunification of churches between the Orthodox and Latin Rite churches. And his health wouldn't permit him to do this, but he said, I will be a missionary here in obedience and in the exercise of my ministry. He said, every soul who seeks my ministry will meanwhile be my orient. He wanted to seek to, to reunify the East and the West Orthodox churches. And he spent most of his 52 years of his priesthood hearing confessions. And many hours every day he would do this. His uh, small little confessional, which they said was freezing in the winter, hot in the summer, uh, during one of the bombing raids, I guess in World War II, everything else was obliterated but his little confessional that was protected, you know. And he prophesied this. He would tell penitents, he said, God's mercy is greater than any expectation. It seems like a great theme of Pope Francis. You know, as a small boy, he was yelled at in the confessional. But he himself, maybe being deeply affected by this, was gentle and always gave a few words of advice and consolation. You know, priests are God's human instrument and sadly, we do have bad days and we have our weakness and failings, but don't let any shortcoming of a priest keep you from availing yourself to this, this great sacrament of confession. You know, he is there waiting for you to reconcile you back to himself. And <clears throat> I thought found that very interesting that he gave a few words of advice and consolation. He didn't go into long explanations. And so, Maybe that's good advice for all of us, I don't know. Sometimes I think it is good to talk. You know, certainly you can uh, talk things over with the priest and get uh, spiritual advice. But, you know, we are there to be reconciled with God, and that is a sacrament that His grace is poured upon us first and primarily. He would tell penitents, he said, everyone has a mission. You tell them, pray as best you can. You know, I, Listen, recently listened to a testimony by a convert to Catholicism, and uh, he had a dream of the Blessed Mother, and he asked her, what's your favorite prayer? And she said, I love all prayer. But she did say, uh, one of the prayers, O Mary conceived without sin, pray for us every course to thee. That was one of her favorites. But I love that emphasis that any prayer, and we're all gonna pray in our own way as according to our personality, circumstances, 
uh, where we're at in life, pray as best you can. He would also tell priests, he said, a priest cannot be saved unless he works hard for souls. And this he did, you know, to the very day he died. He, he died just before he was about to, to offer Mass. To a novice mistress, he wrote, when people write the lives of the saints, they usually write one long lie. They should write everything about them, their repugnance, their difficulties, the struggles they had to keep themselves holy, even their falls and faults. Instead, far too often, they write only about their virtues, as though they were impeccable and free from the effects of original sin. Only our Blessed Lady had that privilege. Tell your novices so that they will be able to continue in the way of perfection without losing heart on account of their faults. He was a great encourager, you know, in confession and wanted people to, you know, obviously not be discouraged. He would tell a young man, he said, my son, temptation doesn't respect even my gray beard nor any habit. Have faith. Everything will be all right. Faith, faith. And then he would say, I think, something very consoling that goes hand in hand with his ministry of mercy. He says, we have in heaven the heart of a mother, the virgin, our mother, who at the foot of the cross suffered as much as possible for a human creature, understands our troubles and consoles us. That she suffered as much as a human being could at the foot of the cross. She knows our weakness and our sufferings, and she has that, that tender heart for all of us, and she sees all our difficulties. And she is there to reconcile us with her son. And we could say, in a sense, you know, as the image of the church, she is this place of reconciliation, that she is at the heart of the communion of the church, always bringing us into that communion and interceding for us. We need that tenderness. We need the heart of a mother that can take everything in. We need that, especially when we have fallen into sin, but we're not certainly looking for judgment, but we're looking for God's mercy and peace. And she introduces, she brings us into that. May St. Leopold intercede for us, you know, in availing ourselves to God's mercy and being instruments uh, for others for that mercy as well.